So we, we know that our choir is, is fabulous, right? But the unsung heroes sometimes are those who accompany the choir. And I don't know if you noticed what was going on up here, but Susan Bryant and Gene Solomon were both playing the piano at the same time. And that's hard to do. Susan, Susan. That was outstanding, though. I loved that. Thank you. Um, For those of you who've been around, if you're new today, you won't get this. But for the rest of you, um, yes, I do own a robe. Um, and, and And I've heard from a number of you how much you like it. And my response is, I'm glad that you like it. Be anticipating seeing it again the first Sunday in Advent. Just saying. Um, all right, so let's start with a couple of verses of the parable uh, that, that, that we're studying today. Now, I'm going to confess right up front that when I gave the text to the folks who prepare the slides, I gave them verses 33 to 34, which is a nice short text, and that's actually where we're starting, but it should have been through 44. So you're only going to have the first two verses on the screen today. So if you've got a Bible with you or if you've got it on your, on your iPad or whatever, you can, or you can just listen because I will read it to you as we go along. But we're going to start just with the two verses that you'll see on the screen. Um, Matthew chapter 21 verses 33 and 34. This is what Jesus said. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. All right. Now, let's make sure that we've got the image right, the setting right, as we start talking about this today, because some things are going to change rapidly as we go through the, through the text. Um, the setting for the story is that this is a landowner who has a, a plot of land that he's built, building a, a vineyard on. Now, most of the time in ancient Israel, the, when there was a remote landowner like this, they were most likely Roman. Um, which doesn't really add a whole lot to the meaning of the text, just to say that they probably weren't, weren't really well liked by the folks in town. But, but it was somebody at any rate who owned this piece of property and they lived somewhere else and they wanted to farm the property, but they weren't there to take care of it themselves. So they hired tenant farmers to take care of things, right? Now that's not something that is really odd in our society today. If you, uh, have, have, have much experience around farming, you know that the same thing happens. I know someone who has a 200 acre piece of property that they are not, they're not interested in doing a whole lot with. They run cattle and they put those cattle on about a third to a half of it. And the rest of it is just there, right? And so what these people have done is they have, have found some folks who want to raise hay and sell the hay. And so the, these are their tenant farmers, if you will, who come and, and farm, uh, raise the hay on about a half to two thirds of this 200 acre plot of land. And rather than paying money in rent, they give a portion of the hay to the landowner who then feeds it to, to the cattle. All right, you with me? That's a, that's a current kind of a thing. It's, it's very common in agrarian society today as it was back then. So we've got this guy who owns this property. He wants to put a vineyard in. And the thing we need to notice really quickly is that he really takes all of the risk to start with. The owner, no matter who he is, he has the land. He puts a wall around the land. The land, the wall is to keep out the critters that will come in and, and ruin the crop, whether it is by trampling it or by rooting it up. I mean, can, can we say feral hogs here? You know what that is. Um, and whatever it happens to be, the wall keeps the animals out so that the plants can be undisturbed. The watchtower, he puts a watchtower up. And we know from other verses in scripture that watchtowers are not not inexpensive. That's something that costs some money. It costs enough that you're supposed to sit down and count the cost before you build a watchtower. 
watchtower, right? So this watchtower is there. Why do we need a watchtower? Because like in our day, when it's time for the harvest, sometimes people would sneak over the wall and steal part of the, or all of the crop, right? Now, I was in college and in a fraternity. And if you are not a law enforcement person in Williamson County, then I can tell this story. Um, we would get really hungry as college students living in the fraternity house. And, and usually that hunger would come late at night, you know, 10, 11, 12, 1, something like that. And being poor college students, we tried to find places where we could, you know, cut corners on snacking. And around Georgetown, Texas, in Williamson County, there are a lot of corn farmers. And so during the season, when the ears of corn would come ripe on the stalks, we would get in a car and there would be like four of us or so, and we would drive out and the driver would stop and let us out next to the cornfield and then drive off. We would promptly run into the cornfield. I'm turning away from the big crowd to say this. Um, We would then run into the cornfield and grab as many ears of corn as we could carry and then run back out of the cornfield in time for the driver to have gone down a mile or so, turn around, come back, and we would get in the car and make our getaway. People do that. I know. And that's why the landowner built a watchtower. He took all of the risk. He took all of the investment. He put everything into it the way that it needed to be so that it could be a productive farm, right? So he took all of the financial and preparatory work. And and in, in that day, tenant farming, this is the arrangement. A tenant farmer was someone who would, you know, do the work and, and pay the rent in kind, pay the rent in, in, in this case, in grapes to the person who, who, who owned it. Now there's a wine press there too. So maybe, maybe he took it in wine. I mean, that would, that would be my preference rather than the grapes. I I don't care much for grapes. So, um, all of this is as it should be at the beginning of the story, right? It's a great story. This is the way it's supposed to go. And, and, and do you know how the story should go after that? It should go that the, uh, the, the owner of the land sent his representative with a cart or whatever at harvest time. And the tenant farmers gladly and joyfully greeted him at the gates to the vineyard and said, yes, we've had a bumper crop this year and here is your portion. Let's put it in the cart for you so you don't have to do it. That's how it should have gone. Because these tenant farmers did nothing to prepare for this. These tenant farmers got a gift of a vineyard ready to go, and they all they had to do was grow. Now, I know, all they had to do, I know that farming is hard work. I do know that. But I also know that the hardest part of that work was done before they ever arrived. And they should have paid their, their portion, and representatives goes back, and everybody's happy because there's been a good arrangement and it looks like with a good arrangement this year, we can keep the good arrangement next year and just kind of, kind of keep things going. And that's the way it should have gone. But it didn't go that way. That's not how the story continues. So I'm going to pick the story up and, and keep reading on the part that's not, not going to be up there for you. This is starting with verse 35, and, and I'm going to read through oh, somewhere around. Where am I going to stop on this one? 39. Okay. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Not the way the story should have gone. 
So I want to point out a couple of things in this part of the story for us to notice. First, the tenants decided that they wanted to keep the owner's portion for themselves, right? That's, that's the, the, the basic line here is they didn't want to give the owner his portion. They figured, you know, we planted it. We put it in the ground. It's got to come up. We ought to get that too. And he's a rich guy. He owns all this land. He's probably got tenant farms in other places. He's got more than enough. And, and we don't need to worry about it. Our lives are hard. So we're going to keep our, that portion for ourselves. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty dire situation in that, in that culture anyway, as it would be in ours. And we all understand that from a business perspective. If you owe something to someone, you need to pay it, right? That's, that's just what's due. But the tenants thought that they didn't have to. And the reality is, if they had kept the portion of the owner's produce, they still would have been tenants in the eyes of the community. Nothing would have changed as far as their standing in the community was concerned. But that wasn't the worst part of the story. The worst part of the story comes in verse 36. Let me remind you of that. Verse 36, it says this. I'm sorry, verse 38. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. Did you notice that? Take his inheritance. In that culture, there was a law. And the law said, it wasn't the only legal issue in this, but the law said that if if a person died without an heir, if they had property the first squatters to claim the land would get it. You understand what's going on here? These tenants, they're not just going to keep the portion for themselves. They want the whole nine yards. They want to own it. They want to be the ones who have possession of the property. And so they say, let's kill the heir. Maybe he's here because the a landowner has died and he's coming to establish himself or, or maybe the landowner's owner is going to die in a little while, but let's just kill the heir because if we kill the heir, it will all belong to us. So they would cease being tenant farmers and in their minds would thus become landowners themselves by murder. So in verses 40 to 44, we have the next part of the story. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Jesus asks. Those who are listening to him, his disciples, the Pharisees, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. So much for happy endings of the story. Because we see in this particular part that what's happening now is that the very presence in the vineyard is going to be taken from those tenants for what they did, for the way that they have acted. Now, the parable is, of course, about Israel and the kingdom of God. Right? I mean, we know that. It's, it's easy to see that. It's a very, very clearly delineated thing. You know, God is the owner of the vineyard. The vineyard is Israel. Israel became, um, they became rebels. They, they went against God. They did what was right in their own eyes. We learn in Judges. They did all of this, this stuff. And, and, and God sent the prophets to set them right. And they killed the prophets. And God sent more prophets. And they killed those prophets too. God sends his son, Jesus Christ, and they, they're going to kill him as well. So the, the parable to us anyway is very clear. And apparently it was clear to them too because the Bible tells us that the Pharisees knew that Jesus was talking about them. 
right? So here's the thing. God had given them the promised land. He had given them Israel as their possession, right? And in Joshua, um, Joshua chapter 24, verse 13, that's where it tells us, I've delivered you into a land with houses that you did not build, with, with vineyards that you did not dig, with, you know, I, I've given you all of this. You did nothing to earn or develop this land. I gave it to you free and clear is what God tells them. In return, God asks of them obedience. He wants them to offer worship, they through the form of sacrifice. He wants them to offer prayer. He wants them to offer of themselves their work, their labor, their prayer, their praise, and their goods. In Leviticus chapter 18, it says that a tithe of all people's produce is supposed to go to the Levites, the priests, for their service in the first, the tabernacle, later the temple, later the synagogues within the cities where they lived. They were to provide that tithe for the maintenance and sustenance of mission and of ministry. And in Malachi chapter 3, we're told, look, you people are robbing God. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, food to feed the homeless, to take care of widows and orphans, to make sure that needs within the community are being met. God asks of Israel their obedience, their faithfulness, their generosity. But Israel had become corrupt. And even though the Pharisees seemed to be the law keepers and the law livers of the day, they had found sneaky ways to get around some of those laws, retaining money that had been dedicated to God for their own use, for their own power. And God's people were not giving him what he had asked of them. What did he ask? A debt of gratitude, a thankfulness for being given all that they had, being made all that they are, so that they can live and thrive as God's people. But instead of gratitude, they were displaying Selfishness. They were displaying self-directedness, desire for holding on to things on their own and taking from God what is rightfully his. So in the prophetic words of Jesus, God would take the kingdom from them. That's pretty clear. I'm going to take the kingdom from them and give it to someone else who will produce a crop for me. Who is that? The Gentiles. Jesus' prophetic word that the word of God would go out, would pass beyond the Jewish tradition and into the lives and the households of the Gentiles. And here we are. We are the Gentiles. We are the new tenant farmers. We are the tenant farmers who have been brought into a vineyard that we did not make ourselves. We are the tenant farmers who possess only what God has given us. Everything we have, everything we are has been given to us by a holy, loving, and generous God. We are the tenants. So as we are the tenant farmers in the vineyard of God, we owe that same debt of gratitude in our response to God, to the one who made us all we are and given us all we have. And this church was built by people who lived that life faithfully for over a hundred years. I mean, some of you are the direct descendants of people who were here in 1909 or right after when the church was formed. Some of you have been here all of your lives and you know the witness of those who have come before us. Others of us know the witness of those that we've celebrated today. 
people who have offered that debt of gratitude to God for what they've been given, people who have paved the way for Tomball United Methodist Church to be where we are today. This land that we sit on was a gift from someone who loved God so much that they gave the land for God's greater glory in the work that we do in mission and ministry as Tomball United Methodist Church. We have a proud heritage, a proud legacy, a proud history of those who have given that debt of gratitude in the way that they lived their lives, in the way that they shared their witness, in the time that they offered, in the talent that they had, and the generosity of their souls. And again, here we are the recipients of a heritage that is and has been so powerful for the surrounding communities around here, right? Now it's our turn. So today I'm leading you to make your return to God. I've been telling you for a couple of weeks, we were talking about stewardship. One week, I did it so apparently subtly that no one knew. That wasn't, that was too subtle. Then I decided to kind of step things up in today's the day. We really need to talk with one another about what it means to belong to this tenant farm as followers of Jesus Christ. You see, when we become members of a church, in the United Methodist tradition, we make a vow that we are going to support the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And we stand in a long tradition of Christ followers who believe that the Bible is not lying when it says we are called to be tithers of all of that. Now, there's lots of Methodist preachers out there that really get nervous about using the word tithe because they are afraid that people they talk to aren't going to like it, that it's going to make people mad, that people are going to think, oh, all they talk about is money at that church, just money, money grubbing preachers. Ladies and gentlemen, we should not ever be ashamed or embarrassed to talk about the command of God. And we should never be ashamed or embarrassed to share the needs of of the community we have been given to serve. So this isn't me trying to get into your pocketbook. This is me sharing with you a vision of what we can be when we are faithful. You see, when we commit ourselves, our time, our ability, our talents, all of those things, when we commit our money, when we, when we truly offer that tithe of all of those things, there is no end to what we can do. Do you believe me? You're not going to say yes, are you? <laughs> Everybody say yes and I've got you. No. Here's the thing. What could we do? If, if you gave, you know, here's the foundation of this, by the way. Tithing over five things does not mean 2% of each adding up to 10 or some variation of that. It means 10% of each. This is what God has given us. So what would happen if everybody here gave 10% of their time? What would happen if everybody here gave 10% of their talent to the mission and ministry of the church, of their money to the mission and ministry of the church. We would have no lack of volunteers. We would never have to come to you and say, you know what, we're really having trouble with this particular program that we want to put on. We don't have enough volunteers to be able to put it on, so we have to cancel it. You'd never hear about a broken or or, or a canceled program if everybody gave 10% of their time. What about ability? 10% of your ability I mean, everybody's got ability, right? Everybody's got something that you can do. If you think that you have nothing, no ability, no talent, then you call God a liar because you do. He's made us all with something we can do. And everything he has given you, he has given you with a purpose. We might not know what that purpose is just yet. I am an expert kazoo player. I'm not really sure what I can do with that. But 
God will show me if I dedicate the kazoo to God. Right? You have a kazoo? Yeah. The choir is going to do a special number with kazoos next week. Right? What if, what if we spent 10% of our time making sure that in addition to the volunteering we do, we are in worship. Let's see. 52 weeks a year. That's 5.2 Sundays that you're here. No, I don't want to go there. (laughs) Money? Money? Our budget at Tomball United Methodist Church is just over a million dollars. If you didn't know that, now you do. Looking at the demographics around Tomball, around our church, if the active families, not the member families, if the active families in our church tithed, truly tithed, we would have between two and a half and three million dollars against a one million dollar budget. And we have trouble making a one million dollar budget. Just let that sink in. What could we do in mission and ministry with that much money? It's not to be money grubbing. It's to say that God wants us to do everything we can do as a community of faith. God wants us to reach into people's lives. He wants us to serve people. He wants us to provide homes for people. He wants us to feed people. He wants us to proclaim his name. Let the children know who he is. Teach the youth what it means to live a godly life before they're off on their own. Lead adults into being godly families and and leaders within the community. God wants us to do all of these things. And the more faithful we are in our tithing, the more we can do. There is no way around that argument. But I know all of the arguments, all of the issues. Does tithing mean before taxes or after taxes? If everybody commits themselves to after taxes, I'm good with that. I think God will be too. And it'll be light years beyond what we do now. Right? But I can't, I I wasn't raised to tithe and I'm not giving that much. I can't do that. Okay, I get it. I understand that life is hard. I understand that people who are not, I was raised in it. So it's just to me, every, every dollar that I make has always had 10 cents attached to it. Always. It's never been an issue for me because that's the way I was raised. I, I know that some of you weren't raised that way. And some of you were in terminally Methodist churches when we weren't teaching this. And they, did, they said, don't do that. That's you know, just crazy. Okay. Make it a goal. A goal that says, I know where I am today. And I'm going to go up on a percentage or two every year until I get there. And there may be some brave souls out there who say, you know, I'm not where I need to be. And I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to do it. And I, I ask the finance permission, per, finance committee's permission to say this to you. They, they said, yeah. If you make a commitment to go to a full tithe, if after six months you see you can't do it, we'll give your money back. I believe that strongly in how God works in our lives when we do what we're called to do. He helps us find the ways to do what we commit to because it's his mission and ministry that's coming. So 
next week, we're going to quit talking about stewardship mostly. And we're going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about unity and harmony in the body of Christ. And we may really need that after this sermon, (laughs) right? But today, I want to call us to action. To commit to mission and ministry for the year 2020. For all of the things that we know we can do, all of the things that we can do only in God's strength. The fabulous, tremendous, fantastic future that is ahead of this congregation as we live in the legacy we've been given and move beyond it into the communities around us with the witness we've been given. So I'm going to ask you to make your, your, your pledge commitment today. Ushers, I need your help. Don't be reluctant. Come on up. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give these to the ushers and they're going to hand one card to every family in the church who's here, clearly. Um, If you are new among us, take a card anyway. I'll tell you in a minute why. If you have already made your pledge online, a few people have, take one anyway and I'll tell you why. And y'all go ahead and start handing them out. Oh, I'll give them to the choir. Oh, I'll give them to the choir. Choir gets two each. Um, I'm going to get quiet here in just a minute, and I'm going to ask you to, to fill this out. And then when we come to communion in a minute, I'm going to ask you to just bring your f- completed card with you, or, or if you're new and, and you're just holding it, and I'll tell you why in a minute, um, just drop it face down in the basket that I'm putting right here. Right there. Remember, your tithes are, your, your commitments are totally confidential. Nobody will see them but, but our, our uh, financial um, officer who will take care of putting things in the, and all that. So if you need to know, because one of the ways that we know where we need to go is to know where we are. If you need to know where you are relative to tithing, there's a handy dandy chart right on the back. You can find out where you are and what it'll take to get to the tithe. Make a commitment to go up a little bit. You'll put that here. We'll do communion together and we will move on. One last request. Whatever it is you decide and put on this card, don't wait until January 1st to start doing it because we still got to finish the year. And we got a long way to go. A lot of powerful ministry happens between now and the end of the year. And we need your help to get there. So don't wait till January. Put it in and get started. And then we'll compute this for for our our work in in formulating our final budget for 2020. So I'm going to give you just a couple minutes to get started on that. Then we'll start communion and you can finish as as we're doing that and then drop it up here and we'll close. And... We're going to go fast through communion because I've kept you over. I'm sorry. If you are assisting in communion, if you can come on up and, and, and meet Rebecca here in the front. It was on the night that he was betrayed that Jesus had dinner with disciples. He took bread off the table and showed it to them and said, This is my body, my body which will be broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember the sacrifice that I'm making for you. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples and said to them, Take this cup, it is filled with my blood, my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember the sacrifice that I'm making for you. As we prepare to come to the table, just a reminder that you are welcome at the celebration of this sacrifice. It doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to be a member of our church or really a member of any church. If you've heard of this love of Jesus Christ and want it for your life, you're welcome to come and share at our table. In just a moment, the ushers will show you your way 
and you can come and, and celebrate here at the altar rail where you receive elements. You can either get a piece of the, the loaf bread and dip it into the cup, or you can instead have a, one of the little cups. We have both options. If you need a gluten-free option, we have that, and you just kind of wave at the person up here at the altar table, and they will bring it to you. And um, we ask now that as the ushers show you, we come to the table of the Lord. Grateful for the ways you have shared your life with us. For the sacrifice you made for our sin, for the promise of salvation in your son, Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves to you afresh. Go with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.